the new world digital age workplace is the score and the outer circle and the hr programs and policies etc has to be revised re-engineered to fit the changing nature of employment categories the future is a small group of regular workers core workers who will be full-time regular full-time hmm? really be employed by the company and the rest of the workforce will be flexible workers different category hmm? as needed workers okay this fair labor standards act is completely obsolete and the u.s congress is way behind as a business owner i want to do what my business needs to do to help my customers out and as it gets more complicated i realize as the owner what i need my employees to do but i have to ask my hr person hey am i gonna get in legal trouble if i just do and so it becomes so complicated what companies have to do is hire one person that does nothing but figure out compensation uh, to keep them out of the legal hot water. HR people have to be strategic for now. They have to be business leaders that work with senior senior uh, leadership of the corporations to develop people strategies. People strategies, not HR policies and procedures, but people strategies. How to manage the skill the requirements of the organization. The demographics are changing as well. In this new digital age, we gotta we gotta bring it all together. Greetings and welcome to the New World of Work podcast with with uh, Bill Garrison, and then below is Dr. Bob Biswas and myself, Dr. Bob Ramirez. So we talk about people leadership in the digital age. And today, with our episode eight, we're gonna be specifically talking about the changing nature of the workforce and employment categories. So I'm gonna talk, turn it over to Bill Garrison, who's gonna lead us in that discussion. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome, and it's good to be talking with you guys again on these topics. Uh, we, we have seen in the digital world that uh, things have changed. Um, and Dr. Bob, you and I talked about this early on in this podcast uh, history, that uh, force, four forces are leading us in to having to um, catch up to what the wor workplace is like today. And uh, no, it's very obvious to most people in the workforce that the workforces are changing and that the employment categories the government has right now are just not sufficient for what uh, the digital age is ushered in. Do you have any thoughts on that to start with, Dr. Bob? This is my, my take on this. As you know, I've been in HR for a long time. In the early days in HR, the employment categories were, were these. Uh, one is exempt, non-exempt, which is a classification that is a legal classification based on ba which determine whether you pay, got paid overtime or not. Okay, that was one grouping, exempt, non-exempt, and the Fair Labor Standards Act that defined exempt. The word exempt and non-exempt means exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Non-exempt means not exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act. If you were exempt, then you wouldn't, you didn't have to be paid overtime. But if you were non-exempt, you had to be paid overtime. There were to decide whether a person is exempt or non-exempt. There were four tests according to the law, hmm? and the categories were in the four tests: professional, hmm? secondly, administrative third managerial and fourth technical okay so these were the legal classifications and then most companies medium to large companies had their own classification of professional administrative a uh, professional exam prof profession uh, administrative non-exempt managerial executive and all this grouping 
grouping of employee groups or employment categories. In the ch changing nature of work, all of these are obsolete hmm. because in basic, there are basic rethinking of how work gets done. Uh, first, there were remote, there are now remote workers, gig workers, flexible workers, uh, core workers. Hmm. And I can, on the top of my head, there are other categories also. So that is the purpose of this discussion. Are we, the human capital HR people, ready? Or are we accommodating the new categories are still sticking to the old categories which I just described? Yeah, it, seems like, it seems like what's happened is that employers have gotten creative or the the nature of work in itself has changed so that these um, previous categories that the that were defined for us were not sufficient and so we've found creative ways to maybe work around or, or do those type of things in fact I was just uh, on a trip my I took my um, my wife one of my daughters and my mother-in-law we flew to New Orleans and we took an Amtrak from New Orleans to New York. Okay, this is a 25, 28 hour trip, <laughs> right? And it's fun. And we got to go across all these states. My daughter's very interested in collecting states she's been to. So every new state, we would jump off the train, step on the ground, take a picture, and officially we had dipped our toe into a new state. So what was neat about this trip is that we had our own bedroom on the train. And with that bedroom, we got an attendant that was assigned to help us. So we got our meals provided, drinks. Uh, they had to move the bunks down. So this lady, Fran, who worked for Amtrak, was assigned to our roomette. We get on in the train in New, in New Orleans at 9 o'clock on uh, Wednesday morning, let's say. I forget. It might have been Friday. But she introduced herself. Hey, I'm Fran. I'm going to be taking care of you guys this week. You know, let me know anytime you need something. And she did. She was an amazing host for us. And I thought, how is how are they compensating her? Is she getting paid by the hour? And if they are, over this 20-hour train trip, she's going to be making some massive overtime. You know, but of course, labor laws, we can't allow her to be working that long without a break and... Yet she was available to us at any time. I'm assuming, Dr. Bob, that she was exempt somehow, right? She's got some sort of contract that says, you're okay, going to work I, for 28 to... hours. <laughs> Not to get Amtrak See, in trouble is, here. This is the problem, Bill. In, indirectly hit the nail on the head. I think this Fair Labor Standards Act is completely obsolete. And... Uh, the U.S. Congress is way behind. Yeah. Let me say the bottom line. They are way behind. The Fair Labor Standards Act, which, category, uh, which defines the category exempt, non-exempt, they were based on some tests. There were four different tests, administrative test, professional test, the managerial test, and technical test. They were specifically documented tests that... HR people had to fill in to determine whether this person was exempt, non-exempt. And there were, one of the things I remember in the test, there was an 80-20 rule. If you spent 80% of your time in routine, regular administrative work, then you were non-exempt, okay? Hmm? Something like this, there was a test. Well, all those tests, 80-20 in a 20-hour work week, work day, and doing the work on demand and asynchronously, okay? All of those things have really thrown FLSA out the window. And HR people, I don't know what HR people are doing in, with these new categories <laughs> and the old definitions in Fair Labor Standards Act, they are not, they are not congruent, so. Yeah, that is, thinking of Fran here. That is why we are discussing all this in our book. Perhaps Fran is paid by the year, which is a salaried employee, right? Um, but she doesn't get to choose what hours she works. Called, 
there was a misnomer which I have always told my student. There's nothing called salaried or non-salaried. Okay. That is a payroll distinction, classification. How the payroll system looked at you and their calculation. It is not a employment category. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. Are you with me? Yeah. The employment category exempt, non-exempt, okay? And which determined overtime, time and a half and double time. But those are based on those four tests. As I think about the new world of work, those four tests. If you pull, if I pull up the test and you put it up there on the screen, you'll see those tests. The questions in the test do not apply to the new world of work, where this person, lady, is working 20 hours a day on the train, or somebody is working remotely from home, asynchronously working, or somebody is doing this. Those tests do not fit. So that is why we have to rethink employment categories. And nobody Who gets exempt? Overtime, who gets not overtime, we really don't know. Part of the problem is we never, when we classified people, HR classified people, exempt, non-exempt, none of them were filling in the tests. They're just going with ongoing practice, okay? But that's not what FLSA required. FLSA required that you certify a person whether they're exempt, non-exempt, based on one of these tests. I, I would take a bet that many P HR people didn't really know the existence of these tests. Okay. I would imagine too, because of what you're saying, the complications, you know, I, I as a business owner, I want to do what my business needs to do to help my customers out. And as it gets more complicated, I realize as the owner, what I need my employees to do, but I have to ask my HR person, Hey, am I going to get, in legal trouble if I just do. And so it becomes so complicated. What companies have to do you is hire about... one person that does nothing but figure out compensation uh, to keep them out of the legal hot water. Our listeners are really, I'm sure, appreciating why this book is necessary. Okay. People leadership in the digital age. You know, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you an anecdote, not an anecdote, a fact. Okay which you are, most people are completely unaware of, completely unaware. Ignorance is bliss, it looks like. The FLSA has an amendment to the FLSA called the Portal to Portal Act, P-O-R-T-A-L, Portal to Portal Act. You know what the law requires? That law, which is an amendment to the FLSA, it says if the employer requires Bill Garrison to go to a job site, not a regular work location. Remember my words, not a regular work location. Requires Bill Garrison to go to a work site. And Bill Garrison goes to work to the work site on behalf of the employer and comes back home from the work site. Bill Garrison is required to be paid from the time he leaves his house till the time he goes to the work site and till the time he comes back to his home from the work site. That is his work day. So if it takes him two hours to commute to the work site, he needs to get paid for another four hours, portal to portal. That's what FLSA requires. Think about this concept, which is in the law right now, portal to portal act, in context, in reference to the new digital workplace, <laughs> and people all working from home. Think about it. Well, my community- Is the home, yeah, my is the, home the work site? <laughs> Dr. Bob, this morning commute for me was a two-minute walk from my bedroom to my office, right? <laughs> uh, so my commute... But the I whole concept can... of this Portal to Portal Act is not applicable in the digital age. Right. This is the reason for our book. We need to talk about these things and not... Dr. Bob, I, I so agree with you. Yeah, you know, we also have to realize, you know, corporations are realizing that the demographics are changing as well. You know, for example, when we talk about the different generations in the workforce, we've got the baby boomers, you know, born between 46 and 64. We got Generation X, we born between 56 and 1980. The millennials between 1981 and 2000. Generation Z between 2001 and 2020. All these generations working together and they all have different um, 
different approaches to what they consider work and, and flexibility. Not only that, we've also have the world has shrunk and we've got workers from all over this planet, you know, working together on project where we use project management teams where you might be working with different ethnic groups. You know, you might have um, you got your project manager maybe in the States, but you might be working with programmers from India. You might be working with product uh, products in China. You might be working with Vietnam. You might be working with customer service coming from the Philippines. So the new in this new digital age, we got to we got to bring it all together for people not only in the U.S. but our employees throughout the world. So it gets it gets very complicated. Um, let me, to, yeah, Bob. Let me complicate it further for you, <laughs> please. You know, I, I was earlier talking to you guys about the jalebi. This is the yes. jalebi. Hmm? Yeah. The jalebi is an Indian sweet that goes round and round and round without a purpose, okay? So we are in the workplace jalebi now. Hmm? Certain digital jobs are pretty routine, hmm? like the programmer, software jobs. What do they do? They have protocols, programming protocols. Hmm? which are standard protocol. They use those protocols to code. Mm -hmm. There's no really creativity. They have to follow the programming coding protocols to write the program algorithms, right? They are not creating on their way new, new stuff. They just follow the standard protocols, correct? And they write the program and produce the software or the algorithm that makes things work. Is that an according to the old FLSA? Is that exempt or non-exempt? Because non-exempt work is eighty percent routine jobs. Okay, where you you don't create new policies, new ideas, new knowledge. You just do routine, follow procedure manual, and you do. So is programming an exempt or non-exempt? I get. I would take a bet with you guys that most of companies are classifying these programmers as exempt. Hmm? So are they doing routine or non-routine work? Mm -hmm. This issue was challenged by programmers working for electronic games, I think for the electronic arts or one of the companies a few years ago. They were challenged. And the programmer says, we are not exempt. Hmm? We follow routine procedures and we work 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day. Before the, before the Christmas season, we work 20 hours a day just to get the programs done, completed. Hmm? And they file a lawsuit and they won. The Electronic Arts had to pay them back wages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because they prove that they're doing routine work, not mm -hmm. creative. They're not creating new knowledge or whatever. Hmm? You can't fit all the employees in a box, right? And so, we have to, th yeah, we have to think, and as leaders, we got to think outside the box. Digital age, the boxes has been completely broken up, opened up. <laughs> yes. Here, and here on the screen, I've got the box. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is the government categories for employment. Um, Dr. Bob was talking about a, several of them, but you're either an employee, you're self-employed, maybe slash contractor, or you can be an unpaid family employee. Everybody else is considered unemployed. So these boxes, uh, these categories, this it's hard to, to do that. And we even have in the digital age now these new people called gig workers that don't fit any of these categories, right? They're not, uh, when someone does a gig, they're not um, an LLC or a sole proprietor. They haven't filled out paperwork. They're not protected or anywhere in the um, FLSA uh, act or either. Yeah, uh, Bill, I already said it. I think the F FLSA, like, we have a chapter in the book called Obsolete Labor Laws, okay? Which we are going to do a podcast on later, I'm sure. But this, but this is an example of the labor law. FLSA was written in the 1940s, late 1940s. Uh, these laws have to be completely revisited, re-engineered. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think the U.S. Congress has a clue that these things are obsolete in this digital age. So the laws are really lagging behind the times. And, uh, and HR practices and policies have to be updated, you know, changed. The way we categorize in, uh, workers, I'm not using the word employee. I think the future is a small group of regular workers, core workers who will be full-time, regular full-time, mm-hmm. really be employed by the company. And the rest of the workforce will be flexible workers, different category, mm-hmm. as needed workers. Okay, that is the work model going forward. If that's the work model, standard work model, okay, then what legislation needs to be revised is the big open question. We are yeah. throwing out this no man land. The fact that the nature of work is changing was highlighted by this movie, Nomad Land. There's a whole segment of the American population that are nomads. They live in vans. This is the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, please see it. They live in these vans, fancy vans. Some of the vans are really fancy. It's they are they are homeless. Mm. They are houseless, houseless, but not homeless. Yes. They are houseless, but not homeless. They go, go from gig to gig around the country, like gigs in the Amazon warehouses, etc. Hmm? Yeah, in peak season, they hire a bunch of new people for short-term purposes, and they go from one gig, one warehouse to another warehouse. And yeah. they build a life, social, everything, life friendships, etc., around this lifestyle. Yeah, so, the, the picture that we have up right now, Nomadland is the movie. It won a picture of the year a couple of years ago, and it, it is dramatized this lady that's uh, in the picture. She does live in a van and moves from uh, place to place picking up jobs. The three individuals across the top are actually YouTubers that I uh, listen to and and watch um the the top left is caravan carolyn you guys can look her up on youtube she does videos um the guy on the right we introduced last week is a nomadic fanatic he lives in his rv is an excellent videographer does uh, a, a, a awesome things there hopefully gonna be a guest on our podcast in in the coming weeks the guy in the middle though i i thought most represented the nomad land um, movie. His name is James from Wanderlust Estate. That's his podcast. And he actually goes uh, from town to town and does Amazon short-term contracts. So just like the lady did in the movie. And so he'll pick up and go work uh, at Amazon for a while or he'll follow the harvest seasons um, like the the migrants of, of yesteryear would do. And he just, he works for a little while, makes some money and then travels and then works some more. And his videos, he's been all over the country. And what's neat, what Dr. Bob, you were just saying, these three individuals on top know each other. They run into each other on the road. They spend time with each other. They watch each other's videos. So there's this whole community uh, that's there. In fact, Nomadic Fanatic, uh, end of last year, maybe the middle of last year, his um, travel companion is, is a cat named Jax. Um, Jax passed away after being on the road with him for 10 years. And the entire YouTube community that um, does is this van living were brokenhearted. And they reached out and, you know, offered messages of support with him. And he's went through that. Uh, he now has uh, two new cats that are characters of the show, you know, and... So they're they're part of his life, and everybody loves his cats. And uh, when they see him, they they want to hug their cats and uh, as well. So it's a really neat thing. But how do you categorize these guys in today's uh, labor laws? Right? 
Well, Bill, I also have to add to that that you know the the younger generations who want who want the freedom to choose what they want to do, they love the gig economy, and the gig economy is just growing. Uh, look at Uber. You know the size of Uber. That's a perfect example of of a gig worker. Um, you know, you described it before in one of the chapters as as the way the gig term started was a garage band, and they had a they had to play. In a, in a bar or something for an evening. So they worked for just one night playing. They got paid for that with no further expectations. So that's how the gig started. But now we've got so many different jobs that can be found through the gig economy for freelancers and traveling nurses and uh, Uber drivers and pizza delivery people, food delivery people. It's just expanding. And so these yeah. these they have to be protected as well. You know, when we look at the employment oh, contracts, these, these types of jobs, asynchronous jobs. You know, the for our listeners, asynchronous means not simultaneous. Okay, mm-hmm. synchronous means person who went to the job, went to a office location or a factory or whatever. These are asynchronous, okay? They don't regularly go to a physical location. Right. As I said, the future is a small group of core employees and a massive outer circle of flexible employees. So, I agree. I already, when I started the podcast, I told you the old definitions of employee categories. Now is the time to realize the new world, digital age, workplace is the score and the outer circle. And the HR programs and policies, etc., has to be revised, re-engineered to fit the changing nature of employment categories. That is that is the point we are highlighting here. And not, I, not for the role I, of getting the paperwork. Carry on right. with this. I have to tell you, Bill and Bob, this the word job is obsolete in the digital age the word job with a job description knowledge skills and abilities all of these things that went into job analysis job descriptions job there are no more jobs there are roles there are individual people roles so hr people who are still thinking about job analysis job evaluation salary structures, salary ranges, you are obsolete in this new change to workplace. There are no more jobs. There are roles, the flexible roles, okay? You can today be a program manager XYZ. Tomorrow you can be program manager of ABC or DEF or whatever, okay? There are no more lifetime careers, etc. Companies are not offering lifetime careers. <laughs> Companies are not offering lifetime careers. And right. employees don't want lifetime careers. By the way, the reason I chuckled is you put a picture up of Jalebi. Yeah. <laughs> it really t- tells you why I'm saying we are in a, living in a period of Jalebi. <laughs> going round and round. Hmm? We need to clear up the jale- make what do you call make sense out of the jalebi. <laughs> That's too funny. Hmm? <laughs> so yeah, so so your so right, book is an attempt to, to so what clear do you, up the jalebi. What do you suggest that uh, I, I if I'm a HR um, leader now, HR manager, what should I do to change uh, my outlook? Because I I, I feel threatened by what you just said that um, I'm going to be what I, my knowledge and my skills are perhaps going to be useless pretty soon. What should I do to, to make sure that I'm not obsolete? The HR profession under the leadership of, under the, the wisdom of Dr. David Ulrich, who is one of the leading thought leaders in HR, has already been talking about changing the role of HR people. HR people cannot be mm, the monitor of policies and writing policies and procedures and stand, 
standard policies and procedures. HR people have to be strategic for now. They have to be business leaders that work with senior senior uh, leadership of the corporations to develop people strategies, people strategies, not HR policies and procedures, but people strategies, how to manage the skill the requirements of the organization. So they have to be creative skill, skill talent management people. And the HR profession is already moving there, moving to this new paradigms. Okay. A lot of people, old, old job titles like an HR personnel manager, HR manager are all becoming obsolete. And now HR people are being asked to be strategic business partners. Okay to help the organization with their talent management requirements, not managing human resources. HR people have to adopt an outside in view of people management, not an inside out view of people management. This is what this whole book is all about. An outside in view of people leadership. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, this book does give the playbook to the HR professional on how to become a people leader by understanding the environment, how the environment shifted. I think we do a great job of explaining all that and really just being more strategic in the thinking uh, of getting the job done, but helping the, the people see that they are a partner in that. So. Robert, thought- managing the human asset, Bill. Oh, yes. HR's new role will be managing the human asset, not human resources. Right. In the new world of work. So, it's Bill, pop up that, uh, that last slide that you have. Because I think in closing, I, I think that says, says quite a bit. So, the workforce is more diverse than ever. People leaders focus on bringing out the best of each individual workers, regardless of label. So that's the direction we're headed. Um, and there has to be lots of lots of changes that need to be made in this new digital world. Well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Dr. Bob, once again. And Dr. Robert, thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.